بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين المباد Dear respected brothers, elders, ulama'i kiram, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Can I request the brothers, unless they are post 50 or they have a back problem, to come slightly forward? Brothers, come slightly forward. It's one of the etiquettes of the gatherings. <coughs> The life of a true believer is that he spends his every moment of his life in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means he spends his every year, every month, week, day, hour, minute and second in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the true believer understands that if one moment elapses without the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if he was to spend whatever is in the dunya to retrieve that one moment, it will never come back. And this is why every morning, the day calls out to man and says, Ya ibn Adam, ana khalqun jadeed wa ala amalika shaheed, iqtani minni fa inni la'udu ila yawm al qiyamah. It says, O son of man, I am a new creation, and I am upon your actions a witness. So derive benefit from me, because I will not return until the day of judgment. And when the day returns on the day of judgment, either it will give a witness for you, or it will give a witness against you. One of two things. Either for you or against you. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, when the believers enter into Jannah, they will only have remorse over one thing. And that is those moments which elapse without the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else would they have remorse upon besides those moments which elapse without the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the reality is that if a person spends every single moment of his life in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even then he cannot repay the basic favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon him. Imam Hakim has related in Mustadrak that there was a man who lived on an island and he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 600 years. 600 years he unflinchingly worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his dua was that when Allah takes him away from this dunya, Allah takes him away in the state of prostration. And it happened so that when he passed away, he died in the state of prostration. And when he came in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah said, take my servant into Jannah through my rahmah. And this man said, oh Allah, not through your rahmah, through my worship. I worshipped you for 600 years. And Allah said, do you want to enter Jannah through your worship? He said, yes Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the angel to bring a scale and place his 600 years of worship in one side and just the favor of his eyesight in the other side. Recently they did a survey in Switzerland that how much would it cost to duplicate one human eye? They came to the conclusion that it would cost 48 million dollars. It will be the size of a horse, and it still will not have the mobility of a human eye. So they placed his 600 years of worship in one side of the scale, and just the favor of his eyes in the other. And the side in which his favorite eyesight was, was heavier than his 600 years of worship. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, take him, throw him into the Jahannam. And when the angels were dragging him into the fire of Jahannam, he said, Oh Allah, enter me into Jannah through your Rahmah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called him and he said, Oh my man, was it the time that I brought you into existence and you did not exist? He said, Indeed Allah. And Allah said, I did that through my Rahmah. He said, Did I not bring for you clean water from salty water? He said, Indeed my Lord. Allah said, I did that through my Rahmah. He said, did I not allow you to worship me for 600 years? He said, indeed my Lord. Allah said, I did that through my rahmah. Allah said, did I not allow the angels to extract your ruh while you were in the state of prostration? He said, indeed my Lord. Allah said, I did that through my rahmah. So now enter into Jannah through my rahmah. Now enter into Jannah through my rahmah. But the reality is that there are very few people who spend their entire life in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reality is that we'd be lucky if we spend 60 minutes a day in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a reality. 
This is a person who spent 600 years and Allah entered him into Jannah through his Rahmah. And how much time do we take out for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Today I want to speak about a person who did spend his every moment in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was well known about this person before he embraced Islam that there was more likelihood of his donkey embracing Islam than him. This is what the Sahaba would say, there's more likelihood of his donkey embracing Islam than him. But this shows that guidance is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That whoever Allah decrees guidance for, if the entirety of humanity unite on its misguidance, they will never be able to misguide him. Never will they be able to misguide him. And similarly, if the entirety of humanity unite upon the guidance of a person, and Allah has not decreed guidance for him, he will dwell in the darknesses of kufr for the rest of his life. This man was no other than Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. And it is the final moments of the life of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu that I want to speak about today. The famous Tabi'i Sa'id ibn Musayyib rahmatullahi alayhi mentions that upon occasion we were returning from Mina to Mecca. And when we reached the outskirts of Mecca, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu wanted to rest. And he took some sand and he made a pillow out of it. This was the man who was the leader of the superpower of his day. But what was his pillow? It was sand. And before he lay down, he made a dua. He said, Allahumma inni as'aluka shahadatan fi sabilik, wa mawtan fi baladi rasulik. He said, oh Allah, I ask you for martyrdom in your path, and death in the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And Hafsa radiallahu anha, the daughter of Umar radiallahu anhu, who was listening to this dua, and she found it strange that if you want martyrdom, you go in the battlefield. You go and do jihad, you want martyrdom and you want it in the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted the dua of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. The incident leading up to the martyrdom of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was that in Medina there was a Zoroastrian slave, a Persian <coughs> fire worshipper. And he was a slave of the famous Sahabi radiallahu anhu, Mughir ibn Shu'ba. And Abu Lutlu was a very skilled carpenter. And what he would do, he would work and he would give a portion of his wealth to his master. Upon occasion he came to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu and he complained that the amount that he had to give to his master was excessive. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, I will speak to Mughira and I will get back to you. And Umar radiallahu anhu spoke to Mughira and he came to the conclusion that the amount that he had to give to his master wasn't excessive. And when Abu Lutlu came back, Umar radiallahu anhu informed him of his decision. And Abu Lulu became enraged. And he said, oh Umar, is your justice for everybody in the dunya besides me? And then he would go around Medina and he would say, Akala Umar o Kabdi, Umar has eaten my liver. Upon occasion, Umar radiallahu anhu was walking by and he saw Abu Lulu. And addressing Abu Lulu, Umar radiallahu anhu said, he said, oh Abu Lulu, I hear that you make great windmills. Make me a windmill. And Abu Lulu said sarcastically, he said, oh Umar, I will make you a windmill that the dunya will speak about. I will make you a windmill that the dunya will speak about. And he went on his way. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he turned to his companions and he said, Do you know what he's alluding to? He's alluding to the fact that he will try to kill me. And the companion said, O Mirul Mu'mineen, if that's the case, then let's deal with him now. Let's deal with him. And listen to the words of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. He said, Preemptive action cannot be taken on the basis of suspicion. Preemptive action cannot be taken on the basis of suspicion. This was a kafir who was going around Medina and saying that Umar has eaten his liver. And at that time Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was the leader of the superpower of his time. They had defeated the Romans and the Persians. But Umar's sense of justice wouldn't allow him to take preemptive action. Really in the justice of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, there is a great lesson for those who regard themselves as civilized. Those who initiate wars on the back of preemptive action. Who lock up people indefinitely because they may do this or they may do that. Who lock up people on a faraway island and leave them in legal limbo like Guantanamo Bay because they may be a threat to national security. 
who really stooped to new levels of injustices, like locking up a 13-year-old child on Guantanamo Bay. Do you recently remember this incident about this girl who ran away with an American soldier, Shimon Pennington? She was a 13-year-old girl, and they didn't blame her because she was young, she was vulnerable, she was innocent. And no blame was leveled against her. But here you can lock away a 13-year-old child on a faraway island, in a cage, and you can still regard yourself as civilized. If you want to see justice, you look into the life of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. That his deep insight allowed him to ascertain from the words of Abu Lu'lu'a that he would try to kill him. But his sense of justice did not allow him to take preemptive action. The day Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu passed away, Amr ibn Maymun rahmatullahi mentioned that between me and Umar ibn Khattab there's only one person. Meaning that I was in the second saf. In front of me was Abdullah ibn Abbas. And then it was Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. And he mentioned that Umar radiallahu anhu came, he straightened the safuf. And he said, Allahu Akbar, and he began the salah. And Abu Lu'lu was hiding in the mihrab. He was hiding in the mihrab. See, in those days, the masjid weren't huge structures. They were small. They were dark. The ceiling of Masjid Nabi Wasallam barely exceeded the heads of those who prayed within it. And there was no fancy carpet. And the walls were made out of unbaked clay. But the men which emanated from these massages were baked. And today, you have these huge structures. But the men which emanate from these massages are the likes of me and you. Soft as the pillows that we sleep on. And Abu Lu'lu'a, he had bought a knife, two-edged knife, and he dipped it in poison. And when Umar radiallahu anhu began his recitation, Abu Lu'lu'a jumped out and he stabbed Amir al-Mu'mineen a number of times. And Umar radiallahu anhu, whilst he was falling to the floor, he managed to hold the hand of Abdurrahman ibn Auf, and he dragged him upon the masalla. He's been stabbed a number of times, but he's still concerned about the salah of the believers. And then Abu Lu'lu ran out and he was stabbing the Sahaba. He stabbed 13 Sahaba out of which 7 passed away. Until finally he was overpowered and they threw a cloak over him. And when he knew game over, he slit his own throat. And Abdurrahman ibn Uf radiallahu anhu recited two very short surahs. And then they turned to Amir al-Mu'mineen. And the first thing Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said, he said, he sent Abdullah ibn Abbas to find out who had stabbed him. And Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu came back and he informed Amir al-Mu'mineen it was Abu Lu'lu the Zoroastrian slave. And in, even in this state, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he became elated, he became happy. He became happy and he said, Alhamdulillah alladhi lam yaj'al meetati ala yadi rajulin yashjidu lillahi sajdatan. He said, Alhamdulillah alladhi lam yaj'al meetati ala yadi rajulin yashadu la ilaha illallah. Alhamdulillah alladhi lam yaj'al meetati ala yadi rajulin yuhajuni bin la ilaha illallah yawm al-qiyamah. He became happy and he said, Oh, praise be to Allah that he did not make death fall upon the hand of a person who even did one sajda in his life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Oh, praise be to Allah who did not make my death fall upon the hands of a person who recited the kalima, La ilaha illallah. He said, Oh, praise be to Allah who did not make my life fall on the hands of a person who will come on the day of Qiyamah and will argue with me with the kalima, La ilaha illallah. Because really, it was inconceivable for these people that a Muslim will take the life of another Muslim. Because they understood the words of the Prophet ﷺ when he was doing tawaf around the Kaaba, and he turned to the Kaaba and dressed in the Kaaba, he said, Indeed, you are honorable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But know that the life of a believer is more honorable than you are. And they understood the words of the Prophet ﷺ, that the destruction of the entire dunya is lighter in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the murder of one believer. The murder of one believer. I ask you, what would you say about a person whose intention it was to destroy the Kaaba? You would say he's a degenerate. You would say he's the scum of the earth. The Prophet is saying that the murder of one believer, the blood of one believer is more precious than the Kaaba. And now you see it's a norm that a Muslim will take the life of another Muslim. We complain that globally the kuffar are taking our lives. But you look, if the kuffar weren't taking them, we would be taking them. You don't have to go far, you don't have to go global, you don't have to go national, you can go local. Where one gangster will pop up another gangster. One Muslim will pop up another Muslim because he wants to be the baddest drug dealer in town. 
because he wants to have the greatest street cred in town. And he will kill his Muslim brother, because he's deluded by this dunya. I often wonder, what will these people do on their day of judgment, when they stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the wife will come and she will say, Oh Allah, this is the man who left me a widow. I often wonder, what will they do on the day of judgment, when the child will come and he will say, Oh Allah, this is the man who left me an orphan. In the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a Sahabi, he was in the battlefield and he was about to strike the enemy. And when he saw that the Sahabi was about to strike him, he threw down his armor and he said, Ashadu la ilaha illallah. And the Sahabi still struck him. And when they came back to the Prophet ﷺ, and they told the Prophet ﷺ what had happened, the Prophet ﷺ became so enraged. He said, what will you do on the day of judgment? When this person will, will come with the kalima, la ilaha illallah. And the Prophet ﷺ repeated this again and again and again. And the Sahabi mentioned that when I saw the anger of the Prophet ﷺ, I said, Oh, a messenger of Allah, he only did this to save his neck. And the Prophet ﷺ became more angry. And he said, Hal shakakta sadra? He said, Did you slit open his chest to see what was in his heart? Did you slit open his chest to see what was in his heart? In some narrations, it is mentioned that this Sahabi was no other than Osama bin Zayd radiallahu anhu, the beloved of the Prophet. And other narrations mention that this Sahabi says, when I saw the anger of the Prophet sallallahu I wish that I hadn't embraced Islam until that day. This was a kafir who was in a battlefield, and it's a possibility that he recited the kalima, la ilaha illallah to save his neck. But look at the response of the Prophet sallallahu because this is the value of a life of a believer. And now you see, Muslims popping off other Muslims. Why? Because they want street cred. Because they want to be the baddest drug dealers in town. What will these people do on the day of judgment when they stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What will these people respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the person whose life they have taken stands in front of them? What will these people do? And the reality is many youngsters are very impressed by these drug dealers. You know, you drive a 50,000 pound car, you have a thick wallet, and you don't have to work a day in your life. And they see these people, and they become envious, easy way out. But let me tell you, Allah deprives these people of any barakah in their life. And this is a reality. I've spoken to these people, they have no barakah in their life. And the reason for that is that they're always watching their own back. Why? Because Allah makes their life a misery like they make other people's lives a misery. Like they make other innocent people's lives a misery. Have you ever seen a woman whose husband's a junkie and he comes home and he batters his wife black and blue? Don't you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears her cries? Don't you think this affects the drug dealer? Have you ever seen the child who's literally brought up an orphan because his father's a druggie and he has no time for his child? Don't you think Allah sees the loss of childhood? Don't you think this affects the drug dealer? Have you ever seen those parents who bring up their child with all the love and affection in this dunya, and they have lost the aspiration for that child, and he becomes a crackhead? And the same child who should have been the coolest of his parents' eyes, steals and beats his own parents. Don't you think Allah hears the pain and the anguish which emanates from their heart? Don't you know that between the dua of a Muslim person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no hijab. Allah hears it directly. How many people's lives do these people make a misery? And how many youngsters suck up to these guys? Make them their role models. Let me tell you, these people are not men. These people are bloodsuckers of innocent people because they are number one and they don't give a jack about anybody else. And this is a reality. They don't care. They don't care if they spoil people's homes as long as they drive their big cars and they have their sick wallets. And these are not men. Let me define for you what a real man is. Not through my word, but the word of the Prophet sallallahu The Prophet sallallahu was speaking to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. And he said, who is the strongest from amongst you? And they said, it's him who can overpower him. It's him who can overpower him. You know, like we say, it's him. You know, who pumps the most iron. It's him who knows Aikido. It's him who the gunman. You know, will take other people's lives without a flinch. And then he'll regard himself bad. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, it's not them. It's that person that when he's angry, he can control his anger. This is a real man. Because it's easier to punch out somebody's lights than to forgive a person. This is a real man. 
And therefore understand that if you are well impressed by these people, the drug dealers, etc., then you're a weak person. A real man is him who can control his nafs because he understands that on the day of judgment, he will stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever action he has done in this dunya, he will have to answer in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a real man. A man who can control his anger when he's angry. And then, Umar radiallahu anhu, what would happen that he would become conscious and then he would become unconscious.